Okay, before I start, I just want to say that uh, Jeff's talk reminded me of the happy 90s when, uh, I don't, I, I don't want to say we, but I was doing something that I had no clue about and made horrible embarrassing mistake and it still was somewhat useful. Uh, thankfully, due to later works of uh, Oded and Daniele and, and Craig and Vadim, that age of innocence is behind us and now we have like a theory for uh, things that work for, uh, for lattices. But uh, after you'll hear uh, Sanjam uh, talk tomorrow, we might enter into another uh, age where we can do things that we have absolutely no clue about and hope that things, useful things come out of them. Uh, and definitely there is a lot of room there to develop these uh, hacks into an actual theory. Uh, so what I'm going to talk about today is a tutorial on homomorphic encryption. Uh, so let's just start with uh, what is homomorphic encryption and why we may want it. So the issue is, you know, I want to delegate processing of data without actually giving away access to it. So um, there's Alice there, uh, and she has some X that she wants to compute something on, and she wants to delegate computation on to some powerful server somewhere uh, in order to evaluate some function on X. So since she doesn't really want the server to learn her X, she would encrypt it and send it to the server. And the hope is to have some mechanism, which here in the slide is, is denoted by this colorful box, where uh, it can take her encrypted input and take whatever function the, uh, she asks the server to compute on that encrypted input and outputs an encryption of the function evaluated at X. Uh, and if we have this uh, colorful box, then uh, the server could apply it uh, and send the result to Alice. And since Alice has the key, she would be able to decrypt and get her answer without ever telling the um, server what she was talking about. Uh, so that's all the motivation that I'm going to give. Uh, a couple of uh, remarks, some of them historical and some of them uh, notational. So the possibility that the, the observation that something like this might be possible came as early as the beginning of public key encryption uh, where uh, Rivest Adelman and Detosos defined this uh, privacy homomorphism and the observation is that we, we have these two spaces and plain text on one side and cipher text on the other uh, and we have these mapping back and forth between them encryption to go from plain text to cipher text and decryption to go in the other direction um, and then there is this operation that we would like to apply to a uh, plain text. Uh, and it really would have been nice if there was an uh, equivalent operation that we can apply to the ciphertext that would maintain this homomorphic-like property. If we take x1 and x2 and apply the operation, we get y. If we take an encryption of x1 and an encryption of x2 and apply this other ciphertext side operation to them, uh, we get an encryption of y. And in fact, there are crypto system. Even RSA has uh, properties that are sort of homomorphic in this setting. So if you think of uh, RSA encryption as this raw encryption that, that just takes uh, uh, X and raise it to the power of E mod N, uh, then if you multiply two encryptions, you get an encryption of the product. Um, and in fact, uh, ever since uh, 78, we had several crypto systems that were somewhat homomorphic in the sense that you can compute some function on encrypted data. So there is the Golders or Mikali uh, uh, crypto system where given an encryption of two bits, you can compute an encryption of their exclusive or. Uh, and there are other that uh, have the different uh, functions that you can compute. What we really want, however, is this colorful box that can do it for any function. So you give it an encryption, you give it a description of the function that you want to evaluate and outcome an encryption of the evaluated value. Um, some notations. An encryption scheme here would be a public key encryption scheme, even though when I actually get to describe one, I'm gonna describe it as a secret key encryption, but it's for notation purposes, it's easier to think of public key encryption. And in fact, it's well known by now that for homomorphic encryption, this distinction between public key and secret key is not very important. 
Um, so let's stick with that. We have a key generation algorithm and an encryption and decryption. Key generation uh, will output uh, a matching pair of public key and secret key. Um, our plain text space throughout this uh, talk at least will always be zero one. So we want to encrypt bits and then compute functions on these encrypted bits. Uh, and we have the encryption uh, operation that takes the public key and generate in a bit and generate a ciphertext and the decryption that takes the secret key and a ciphertext and recovers the bit. Uh, and the notion of security that we're interested in uh, is the classical notion of semantic security uh, where to say that the two distribution, a public key and an encryption of zero or a public key and an encryption of one, these two probability distributions are uh, indistinguishable, meaning any efficient algorithm would fail to distinguish them. This is the uh, notion of uh, success and failure that Daniele talked about. We have two distributions. Uh, no efficient algorithm should be able to distinguish them with any noticeable advantage. Uh, homomorphic encryption is first just a public key encryption scheme. Then we, we have some additional functionality requirement. It's not an additional security requirement. The security is still semantic security. It's just an additional functionality requirement. And that is we need to have an efficient uh, algorithm to evaluate functions on encrypted data. So there is this eval thing. Uh, it takes an encryption of x. It takes a description of a function f. And, it, and the public key, and it outputs a new ciphertext C star. Uh, and the property that we want is when we decrypt C star, we should get f of x. Um, we do not, at least in this talk, we do not require that C star looks like a fresh ciphertext. Maybe somebody that looks at C star can tell that this was not generated by the encryption algorithm. It was generated by evaluating things on encryption. Uh, as long as it decrypts the right thing, we're happy. Uh, one thing that we will require, however, is that decrypting it is easier than computing the function from scratch. Uh, because otherwise it's not very interesting. Otherwise we could just attach the f, the description of f to the ciphertext and ask the decryption algorithm, please decrypt x and evaluate f on it. Uh, that's not a very useful notion. Uh, formally, the way we rule out that is we just say that the size of f, of the evaluated ciphertext is too small to, dis to uh, describe C. It does not depend on the complexity of C. Um, and once you add this, it becomes a non-trivial notion, and this is the notion I'm going to talk about. All right, what do we know? We didn't know for a long time how to do that. Um, there were various uh, attempts at it, uh, some of them almost successful, others not so much. The first plausible con uh, candidate came in, in work of uh, Craig a couple of years ago. Um, security in this sense, showing that this is semantic secure, semantically secure, uh, was based on some hard problems in ID lattices. Um, it was polynomially slower to evaluate uh, on ciphertext than it is to evaluate on the plaintext, uh, which is good. The polynom polyno particular polynomial that we were talking about was kind of big. Uh, and in the last couple of years, there have been many advances. So in particular, we have now schemes uh, whose assumption, wh whose security is based on other assumptions, like learning with errors, or ring learning with errors, or the entry assumption, or the approximate GCD assumption. Uh, we have schemes that are more efficient than the original one. And we have schemes that have, a, that have other advanced properties. So sometimes you may want your encryption to do more than just encrypt. So you may want to use identity-based encryption. Or you may, may want to do the multi-key, where many people publish their public key. You can encrypt things relative to many different public keys, and still you can compute uh, on the resulting ciphertext. And then, of course, you would need all of these keys uh, to be able to decrypt the result. So. Uh, many things happened in the last four years. Uh, in this talk, what I'm going to describe is something which is either the simplest or the second simplest uh, uh, homomorphic encryption scheme. Um, it's essentially taking the Regev uh, crypto system for 2005 and showing how to do homomorphic encryption for it. Uh, this is based on work of Prokarski, Vekinatan, and, and uh, Gentry with various subsets of them. Um, 
I'm going to talk, I'm going to describe this. This gives you a somewhat homomorphic encryption, not in the same sense that RSA was somewhat homomorphic. You can compute arbitrary functions, but only for a limited complexity. So you can uh, evaluate arbitrary circuits up to a given depth, and the depth of the circuit that you evaluate is a parameter. Uh, then I'm going to show the bootstrapping uh, um, technique of uh, gentry uh, that would get you full homomorphic encryption out of it. And I'm going to talk about uh, packed ciphertext for efficiency um, um, at the end of my talk. Things that I'm, one thing that I'm not going to describe is the new uh, homomorphic encryption uh, scheme that's also uh, based on LWE in terms of security. Um, you can have us, Greg, if you want to know about that. Uh, this is going to be in, in the script next week. So let's start by learning with arrows. I don't know if this is the first time that this is uh, described here. Uh, and if it is, then this is all you're going to see about it for my talk at least. Um, learning with arrows, what it is, is the following amazing observation. Uh, we all know that solving a, uh, a system of linear equations is a very easy thing. But you just take the linear system of equation and then you add to it a little bit of noise and it becomes incredibly hard to solve. Uh, it was first phrased in this term, in this context, by Regev. Um, when you come to describe the script, the, you come to define this problem, there are many equivalent way, ways of doing that. This is the one that's going to be used for, for my talk. Uh, there are some parameters. There's the parameter Q, which is the modulus. You're going to work mod Q. There's a parameter N, which is dimension. Uh, your secret in this uh, setting will be a short random vector S, uh, which is an, a vector of elements in ZQ, but short elements. All of the entries in this vector are much, much smaller than Q. Um, the input that the... Um, that your algorithm gets uh, is many pairs A, I, B, I, where the A, I's are just random vectors and the B, I's are essentially the inner product between your secret and the A, I's. If this is all there was to it, then we would just solve a linear system of equations to recover the secret, but we're gonna add a little bit of error. And the point is the error is small. That's, the, what's, that's what makes it um, useful. Uh, so you can think of E as chosen at random from some distribution that is concentrated on um, elements very close to zero. Uh, so, and the goal, well, the goal could be many things, but let's, the simplest one is the search version of it. Just find the secret, uh, recover the secret, solve this system of equations with a little bit of error in them. Or more useful for the purpose of encryption uh, is the distinguishing uh, problem, get all of these pairs and then tell me, are they really, did they, did they really come from this distribution or just did I just choose the BIs uh, completely at random? And I think Vadim will tell you that uh, these problems for some range of parameters are actually equivalent to each other. If you could distinguish, you could also solve. Um, the amazing thing about it, this is an incredibly hard problem. If you could solve that problem, this is what Regev showed back in 2005. If you, if you could solve this problem efficiently, then you could solve the SIVP problem in an arbitrary lattice in polynomial time if you had a quantum computer. Um, and then Paker then showed uh, that some other um, a problem, the problem of computing uh, lambda one, for example, uh, you could solve uh, even without a quantum computer. And uh, there are disclaimers, I'm not going to talk about it. Some range of parameters we can prove more about than others. In any range of parameters, as long as you cannot break it with LLL, you cannot break it. This is the, the empirical state of affairs. Either, either, either we set the parameters so aggressively in terms of the ratio between the noise and the modulus so that you can break it with LLL, and if we're not, we have no clue how to, how to break it. That's basically how, how things take, uh, stand today. So, for now, we're just going to take this, uh, this problem the way it's described here and just assume that it, it's hard. And then all the security of our crypto system will be reduced to that. We will build a crypto system such that if you could distinguish encryptions of zero from encryptions of one, then you can distinguish these pairs from random. Yeah. 
Yeah. E. Oh yeah, it should be E. I sorry. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Otherwise, it would be really easy, right? <laughs> Well, this is an n vector, and this is another single number. So I, I just think of it as, as, as a vector one dimension larger. Uh, so when Regev came up with this, um, by the way, this is essentially the way Regev described the, the, prob the problem, except in Regev's case, the secret key was just a random vector. And in our case, the secret key is a random short vector. And then there was the work of Appelbaum et al. from 2009 that showed that these two problems are equivalent. So I'm going to use the version where S is a short vector. Uh, this is Regev's encryption scheme. I'm going to describe it as a shared key encryption where you use the same key to encrypt and decrypt. In fact, I'm not even going to say how to encrypt. Uh, but I'm just going to sh describe what valid ciphertexts are. It's not hard to come up with methods for generating those, but I don't need that for the talk. Uh, so the secret key is just the, the same vector, uh, the, the LWE secret S, which right now I renamed it. Now it's called S prime because I'm going to use S for something else. Uh, and I'm going to use it to encrypt bits. And the way I'm going to use it, I'm just going to choose um, vectors A and additional dimension B, such that, uh, well, this is the bit that I want to decrypt. So let's ignore the, the, the bit that I want to encrypt. So let's ignore that for a second. Uh, I'm just going to choose a, a small error, a random vector S, a random vector A, and then the inner product of S and A plus E. This is uh, my LWE instance. And then I'm going to add into it. Uh, the bit that I want to encrypt multiplied by Q over 2. What happens is if, since I'm encrypting zeros and 1, if this is a 0, then I have my LWE instance. Well, ignore the minus here. But if I have uh, uh, sigma equals 1, uh, sigma equals 0, then I just have my LWE in instance. And otherwise, I'll have my LWE instance shifted by Q over 2 on the B. Easier way to describe the same thing. Uh, I'm going to look at the vector with one dimension larger, S, which is just S prime concatenated with one. Uh, and when I do an inner product between the vector C, when I do an inner product between the vector C and my, my secret key S, uh, what I get is either just the error or the error plus Q over two. And now the error is small. So if I encrypted the 0, that would be a small element mod Q. If I encrypted the 1, that would be an element close to Q over 2. And this is how I decrypt. I'm just going to do the inner product, uh, and I check whether the output that I get is closer to 0 or closer to Q over 2. And this is how I know where, whether I wanted to encrypt a 0 or a 1. Security, when it's expressed in this term, is sort of really, really obvious. Uh, well, if, LW, if the decision version of LWE is true, then AB without that part, AB is just pseudo-random. Well, if something is pseudo-random, it looks like random. If it was random, then adding Q over 2 to it would keep it random. So both cases are indistinguishable from random, assuming that I cannot distinguish uh, whether something is LWE in, in instance or it's random. Um, and in addition, and that's not something, that's something that was known, uh, was known also in 2005, this crypto system is additively homomorphic uh, because I'm just using inner product to decrypt. Right? And so if I'm, as long as I set my, uh, my error small enough relative to Q, then, well, if I take the inner, pro the inner product of uh, S and a sum of two ciphertexts, I just get the sum of the inner products. And if the so the error now is a little larger than it was, was before. But if it's still sufficiently smaller than Q, then I can still decrypt. So it's additively homomorphic. I cannot do infinitely many 
additions, but for a while I can still add things and I would be able to decrypt until the error overflows. More interesting uh, is the observation uh, post Gentry's work, origin, origin, original work, uh, by uh, Brakowski and Rekutanathan, that you can actually multiply these things. And the obvious way to multiply these things that you will see run into some problem is just to use tensor products, right? I mean, uh, we have this uh, equation that tells us that the inner product between our secret key and the ciphertext is roughly uh, the bit that we're trying to encrypt times q over 2, plus a little bit of error over there. So, well, if that's true, then if I take the tensor product of two ciphertexts and then do the inner product with a tensor product of the key with itself, well, I just get, because of the mixed uh, product property, I just get a multiplication of both of these things. That would have been nice if it was mod q, but it's more useful when we can do it actually mod q squared. Uh, and this is the point where we actually need s, the secret key, to be small, because when we do it mod uh, q squared, you get additional error terms uh, of the form, the size of the, I think it's L1 norm here, uh, times Q. But if we choose our secret key short enough, then this thing is still uh, sufficiently smaller than Q squared, and therefore, we still have that thing, uh, this, I can still write it like this. It's the inner product between these two vectors, each one of them was obtained as a tensor product, the inner product is close to the product of the two things that we started from, even when you look at it mod Q squared. And if that's the case, well, I don't want to keep looking at it mod Q squared. I want eventually to go back to my original decryption formula that's mod Q, so yeah, sure. I'm going to uh, divide by Q over 2. Well, that's not really an integer vector anymore. That's not good. I'll round it. Okay, so rounding, adding a little bit to the error. Right, but it doesn't add a lot to the error because all rounding is just, you know, I change the, the value in each coordinate by plus or minus a half at most, and then I'm inner product, I'm doing inner product with this vector. Well, S was really small, so the inner product with S, uh, the tensor product of S with itself, you can't get too large, right? I mean, the, the entries here are, are the product of these entries times the dimension, something. Think of Q as being really, really much, much bigger than all of that. So S, tensor product S, is still very, very short relative to Q. So, yeah, so I rounded it. I got a little bit of extra error terms. Um, and now I finally got a new ciphertext, C star which I got by taking the tensor product of these two and then scaling and rounding. And it decrypts to the right thing. If I apply the decryption formula to it, um, I'm, get the, I'm gonna get the product of these two bits. There's an issue here. Uh, well, first of all, it's the wrong key. It's not the original key, but rather it's a new key that I got by a tensor product of the initial key with itself. Uh, maybe I can live with that, but uh, um, the dimension here is, is, is a little bit of a problem. Uh, well, I started with ciphertext and, and secret keys being uh, vectors of n coordinates. Now I have them, after a single multiplication, vectors of n square coordinates. Maybe I can live with that, but if I try to multiply these, I'm going to get a vector of n cube uh, in, uh, to the fourth uh, coordinates, and uh, I can't do that more than a constant number of times before I run out of uh, polynomials. So that's a problem. And uh, what Bukowski and Vakutmanathan uh, observed is that's a problem that's actually fixable. Uh, and this is a really cute observation here. Well, when we generate the keys, we know S. I don't know what, what the ciphertext C is going to be, but I do know what S is. And I also know what S star is. S star is just the tensor product of S with itself. So it's a vector of n uh, squared coordinates. Uh, I'm going to publish in the public key 
uh, a key switching gadget. This is something that I'm going to be part of the public key. Uh, and then when you later come with your C star, that thing in the public key will let you translate it back to a new ciphertext relative to the original key. So I want to publish a gadget that would let me do this translation from a high dimensional C star relative to the high dimension S star back to a low dimension C relative to S. And it turns out that all you need is an encryption of S star under S. The reason that works is because uh, decryption is essentially linear. So all I want, all I need is uh, um, an n by n square rational matrix W such that uh, S times W is S star, roughly. This roughly is the same roughly as in the LWE case. Um, so in the LWE case, we were talking about integers mod Q. Here I'm talking about a rational matrix. That's just scaling. I need a little more precision. So I'm going to do this LWE instance relative to a bigger modulus Q prime, which is the original Q times however many bits of precision I need here. So that's not an issue. It is an issue in terms of concrete parameters, but not in terms of uh, what I want to do. Um, and then now this matrix is going to help me reduce the dimension because when I have this high dimensional C star, I'm just going to multiply it by W and then I'm going to round it. And then I'm going to do more. So, well, C is that thing. So I can think of it as being just this thing without the rounding, because all the rounding does, uh, the, the only thing that the rounding does here in terms of the, the equation that I want to do, that I want to uh, show, is it adds a little bit of error. You know, you, you do it in inner product with S, so it's like the inner product of this thing with S plus the inner product of the rounding error with S. The inner product of the rounding error of S is small. So I'll ignore that. So the inner product is roughly like the inner product with this thing before rounding. Uh, well, that thing, uh, this thing is, is more or less like, is, is, is roughly S star, so that's more or less S star, the inner product between S star and C star, which is more or less my bit times Q over two. And so in each step here, we accumulate a little bit of error terms, but all of that, uh, we can just set our modulus Q large enough. Now, if you actually try to open uh, this approximate equality and see what error terms you get, you will see that you get an error term which is uh, C um, star inner product with my error vector. And C star is not a small vector. C star is my ciphertext. It's actually a, a pseudo-random vector. Uh, so that seems like a little bit of a problem. And, but this is why we make this a rational matrix, so that we can make the error really, 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 really tiny. So that even when you multiply it by something uh, of the order uh, of size of Q, uh, it still, the, the result is still small. As I said, it doesn't really matter in terms of what we're trying to achieve here. It does matter in terms of concrete security because now the ratio between Q, our modulus, and the error here becomes even larger. Before, you know, we had a small error relative to Q. Now we have even a, an error which is small relative to Q squared. Sorry. Even, right. It's even small without, without relative to Q. It's even smaller at relative to one. Um, so we need much smaller error, which means that the ratio between Q and the error is larger, which means that if we hope to get security, we need to work with larger dimensions. Okay, that's just a, an issue of parameters. Um, yeah, so that's that. And security is essentially still reduced to uh, LWE. And the essentially is because when we define LWE, there is the secret 
and then we use the reg of encryption to use this uh, to encrypt with this secret something that's independent of our secret here we use us the secret s to encrypt something that depends on s that's s star i don't want to dwell on this uh, point uh, Typically what we do if we really want to get an implementable version of this crypto system is just say, well, we don't know how to take, uh, how to take advantage of this extra relation. We don't know how to prove that it's secure either, but let's just assume that it is and be done with it. Uh, a different way of dealing with that is having many different secret keys, one for every level of our cir circuit, and then uh, we're going to publish translation from SI star to S I plus one, uh, and then the thing that we encrypt uh, is going to be independent of the secret that we use for encrypting, and then you can reduce it to L W. So um, this is. Um, the same way that I got an encryption here. So I didn't, uh, maybe I should have had a slide with the actual development of this, but it, it is just the encryption thing. The inner product between S and every column, I think column, maybe well, I forget. The inner product between S and every column of my W is essentially what I want it to be, plus a little bit of error. So just the same way I generate these ciphertext, I'm going to generate the. Let's let's call them columns, if, even if they are rows. Uh, the same way that I generate ciphertext, I'm going to generate each column of my key switching matrix. Well, this is uh, n n dimension, and this is one. I'm going to get one thing out, so I'm just going to use n square of those equations. This, this is generating one uh, ciphertext. The key switching matrix, is, matrix will have one ciphertext per column. And then each column would encrypt one entry of S star. So here, instead of this thing, I'm going to write the if entry of S, uh, of S star. And that gives me the if column of the key switching matrix. Maybe I can do it on the board. Let's see if I can do it on the board. Um, so this is my S star. It has S star one up to S star n squared. And I'm going to. And I want to generate the if column of my uh, key switching matrix, matrix such that the inner product between S and Wi is S star i plus a little bit of error. And now I remember that my S was really S prime and a 1 here. So I'm going to choose W prime uh, at random from ZQ. Okay, let's call let's call the dimension of S n plus one for, for here, so that this one is a dimension n, and then I'm going to. Uh, so this would be the first n coordinate in in, in W, and then uh, W n plus one would be minus S prime inner product W prime I plus S star I plus I. I think that's correct. And then W I is going to be the concatenation of W I prime and W and if I did what 
No, this is, this is what I do during key generation. Yeah, so this is what I do during key generation and once I'm done with generating W this way, I'm just gonna put it in the public key and then it's fixed. And really, this sequence of very simple steps is all we need to get uh, some automorphic encryption. Uh, because now we have a system where we can add ciphertext and multiply ciphertext. Um, and there is some error there. And when we add two ciphertexts, the error grows, uh, doubles. When you multiply some ciphertext, well, it's a little trickier to analyze the, uh, the way the, the, um, the error uh, develops in this case. But essentially the most important error term that you get there is the inner product between the secret key and the rounding errors that you get from various places. Uh, and that's at most will uh, multiply your, uh, your error by some polynomial factor. Um, so let's just call this polynomial n square for the purpose of this talk. Uh, so now we can start uh, juggling the parameters. Let's suppose that we want to compute a circuit of depth d. So then, well, the error at the end will be at most the error at the beginning times n to the power of 2d because every level at most multiplied the, the, the error by an n square factor. Uh, so if we set the uh, initial error, let's say, make, let's say make it n to the d, um, then the error at the end will be, well, at most uh, n to the d times n to the 2d, so we need to make q slightly larger than that, let's say by a factor of 4, and then our error will be less than q over 4, and we're happy. So this is just setting the parameters, and as, as you can see, q has to be sort of sufficiently bigger than n uh, for this to work. Okay, so this is basically it for the somewhat homomorphic encryption. We took Regev's crypto system, which is a very simple thing of, of you know, linear systems with a little bit of error in them. And we show how, well, addition was trivial, but we show how to multiply things and then reduce, uh, using tensor products and reduce their dimension back to n. And we have a system that can both encrypt and uh, both multiply and add uh, for a while. We can uh, uh, use it to evaluate any circuit that we want as long as it's not to be. But uh, Craig wants more. Uh, Craig wants to evaluate any circuit. I'm going to publish one set, of one set of things in my public key and I want to use it to evaluate any, function, any circuit at all, no matter how deep it is. Uh, so far, we, only do, we can only evaluate circuits of a predetermined depth. So if we have a particular circuit that we wanted, we could build this machinery around this circuit, and that machinery would let us take uh, encryption of Xs, feed them into this thing, and outcome an encryption of the circuit evaluated at these Xs. Um, but we can only do that when the Xs are fresh encryptions and have very little errors, errors in them. Uh, what we get is an evaluated ciphertext. It has more errors. Uh, we made, we set our parameters such that you can still decrypt uh, this encryption of Y. But if we're going to try to now evaluate some more, we're going to get something with too much error. And that, that one, the error already overflows and we cannot decrypt anymore. So what do we do? Uh, we use uh, Craig's bootstrapping where um, what we have is a noisy evaluated ciphertext Y and we want to get another encryption of the same Y with less noise. That's our goal. And then once we have that, we can evaluate on this yellow Y for a little bit more before it becomes orange and then we'll apply the same, uh, the same procedure again. Uh, so look at the ciphertext. 
And now look at the decryption function as a function that has the ciphertext hardwired in it, but take the secret key as its input. So it takes an arbitrary input, think about this input as a secret key, and try to use it to decrypt. That's what this, this function is doing. And you can hope that this function is a low depth circuit. Um, and in fact, in this crypto system, this function is a low depth circuit. All it does is sort of inner product and then it picks one, uh, one bit out of this, uh, um, out of, out of this uh, inner product. Now what you do is you include in the, in the public key also this weird looking uh, creature which is an encryption of the secret key under the public key. Now by this time it may be not so weird anymore. We already had that thing before that where I said that uh, you can either encrypt the, the same secret key or you, have lev or you have levels. Here you actually, if you want to get fully homomorphic encryption, you're stuck with this. It has to be the same public key that encrypts its own secret key. And you would have to make to live with the assumption that that doesn't break our security because we don't know how to reduce it to other problems. Uh, so now we have this green encryption of the secret key, and we have our yellow, our uh, orange ciphertext that we want to keep evaluating. Sorry, we want to reduce the noise for, uh, so that we can keep evaluating. And what we do is, given the ciphertext encrypting Y, we can write down the description of this D sub C function. We don't evaluate anything on it. We just write down a circuit that would have this, this ciphertext uh, built in and would take as input an alleged secret key. And then, well, we already have a secret key encrypted, so we're just gonna pass it through that function and out comes the evaluation on this function. And if that D sub C circuit was indeed shallow enough, then the noise here would be smaller than the noise there because we never evaluated that. We only evaluated things on the fresh encryptions of the secret key. Uh, and if we have two Y's that we wanted to uh, multiply, then we will, again, we have two ciphertexts. We can define this, func this multiplication function that takes as input an alleged secret key, tries to decrypt one, decrypt the other, and multiply them. And again, can hope that this is a low depth circuit and do this exact same thing. Um, without ever evaluating explicitly on the Y's, we get a ciphertext encrypting their product. And yeah, again, the more evaluation applies only to the fresh encryption. And that's it. I mean, this uh, amazingly beautiful trick uh, that seems to be building things out of nothing until we see it for the fourth time. Um, let's you take something that couldn't evaluate things uh, um, in, indefinitely. As long as the decryption circuit for that uh, function is, is, uh, is uh, shallow enough, you can then use it to, boot, to bootstrap to get uh, fully homomorphic. Um, from here until the end of my talk, which is when? In 15 minutes? Uh, from here until the end of my talk, I'm going to concentrate on talking about efficiency considerations. Uh, because this is the point where we really can uh, really, really use symmetry in, in, in our, uh, in our lives. Um, so, how deep is the decryption circuit for this scheme that I just described? Well, if your dimension is n and you're using modulus, modulus q, then basically the decryption is, is an inner product mod q. So multiplication mod q takes roughly log q depth to evaluate, and then you have, you have to add n of them, so it's another log n. Uh, so eventually it's log of q times n. Uh, so if you want to be able to evaluate this thing homomorphically, then you need a scheme that can handle a uh, circuit of this depth. So you need your Q to be something like two to the four log at most. Um, and then to get security, you need the dimension which is large enough relative to Q. You, you want, um, right? n has to be 
really bigger than log q, otherwise you can apply LLL to break it, the underlying uh, lattice problem. So n has to be at least quasi-linear in k. Well, that's not particularly surprising. Every crypto system, if you want, sec if you want security k, you need at least k bits of ciphertext. So that's not particularly surprising. Security parameters. So you want k bits of security, well, you can't get it with ciphertext that are less than k bits long. That has nothing to do with, uh, with this particular crypto system. But here it's the dimension that's, that's k, and that would cause us problem because, uh, well, the ciphertext is, is, as I said, only k bits, which is fine, but the key switching matrices, well, it's n by n squared by n matrix. n is at least your security parameter, uh, so the key switching matrix is at least k cubed. Uh, in size, which means that every multiplication that you're going to do, you're going to have to at least read in this key switching matrix, which means that it's k cubed uh, work right off the top. So that you get k cubed uh, slowdown, at least k cubed slowdown versus computing in the clear, and that's not great. And this is where uh, using structured lattices comes in. Um, I'm not going to say why. Uh, this thing is, yep. Right, yeah. You can, uh, no, log depth, uh, log, you, you can, Well, the error will go by a polynomial uh, thing by this. So Q, Q has to be, so we, we need Q to be bigger than, what was it? Uh, N to the order of the depth. So for every level in your circuit, you need roughly log N or, or some multiple of log N bits, additional bits in Q. Yeah, right. so, so you need Q to be bigger than N to some polylog. That's, what you just said was indeed a problem with Gentry's original crypto system. Uh, over there, there were many hoops that you needed to jump through until you got to, to a place. Here, the, there's a, it's, it's exponentially better than the original uh, Gentry crypto system in that respect. So here, the problem doesn't actually show up. So how do we do better? Uh, one thing that gets you most of the way uh, to better efficiency is just to switch from using vectors over the integers to using vectors over more complicated spaces. Uh, in particular, you uh, use uh, um, polynomial rings, um, modulus some f of x, and f of x is a high enough dimension. Why does that help? The reason that helps is because if you just wanted to formulate it as a, as a lattice problem, the problem of breaking the crypto system, you wanted to formulate it as a, as a, as a lattice problem, uh, the dimension of the, of the lattice would grow with B. So yes, these are structured lattice now, lattice with symmetry, but their dimension is nonetheless B. If these problems are hard in, 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 in symmetric lattices with large dimension, then we're good. Notice we didn't made the dimension of the ciphertext, the total dimension of the ciphertext, the number of, the, the number of numbers that you need to write down in order to specify a ciphertext, that didn't, make, that didn't become any smaller. It's still as big as it was before. However, now you can think about, instead of thinking about it as a large vector, high dimension vector, you can think about it as a low dimension vector over a high dimension. Um, so you can get security, if all you worry about is I don't want LLL to break my crypto system, then you can get security with dimension, This the, the, the dimension of that vector over the ring uh, can be as small as two. It cannot be one, unfortunately, uh, and the reason it cannot be one is because remember the secret key was S comma one, the secret key here will also be S comma one. 
So S could be just a single element now, but the one is another one. So you can get the dimension as low as two. Uh, the ciphertext is still as large as it was before. We didn't save anything there. However, the key switching matrix is now much, much slower. It's still n squared by n, but n equals two now, so just eight elements. This is, this is where we save. Uh, so now the key switching matrices is just uh, quasi-linear and therefore we just need to read these quasi-linear many bits when we want to process them and all the operations uh, can be done in time quasi-linear in, in the length of the input so all in all we get quasi-linear slowdown versus computing in the clear whereas before we had quasi-cubic slowdown so that's much much better. But uh, we want to do better than that. So one thing we cannot do is squeeze down the size of our ciphertext. K-bit security, you're going to have ciphertext of size at least K no matter what you try to do. So we cannot have smaller ciphertext, but maybe we can put more bits in every, more plain text bits in every ciphertext that we have. Um, and this is where we start actually using some algebra. So far, you know, F could have been anything. We didn't use the fact that it's, here is where we want to start with cyclotomics uh, because we're gonna use uh, Chinese remaindering to uh, pack more bits into a single ciphertext. Um, okay, so now, well, this was our, uh, this was our, our uh, decryption formula and now we need to interpret what it means exactly when we write it this way and things are not integers. So the plain text now is not an integer, not, not a, a bit, it's actually a binary polynomial. So this is the plain text space. Uh, and what that means is, well, this by itself is just an inner product over R sub Q over the ring of, uh, of polynomials mod f of x and q. And now that you have this element, you express it in some appropriate basis. Let's say that you look at the coefficient of it, or you do some, there are better bases than the coefficient basis, but let's say that you look at the coefficient and you take the most significant bits of all the coefficients. And this is your decryption formula, and this gives you uh, a binary polynomial. Uh, now you're gonna, so decryption would be exactly, encryption, decryption, everything would be exactly the same, except once you go back to the level of uh, uh, plain text polynomials, then you're gonna use uh, Chinese remaindering to pack many bits inside a single plain text. So the order of things is you have many bits, you're gonna interpolate these bits using Chinese remaindering to get this plain text polynomial, you're going to encrypt this plain text polynomial. Encryption and decryption would induce homomorphic operations on the underlying plain text that are in this field. And because of Chinese remaindering, then the individual bits that you packed inside each one of these uh, would uh, added and multiplied. Let me spend a few more uh, slides talking about it. I would, when I talk about the ring switching work, I would spend a lot more time on this, but I, I want to at least show, show a few things. Uh, yeah, well, okay. yeah. Um, well, the cyclotomic is an irreducible polynomial when you look at it over Z, but clearly not mod two, or maybe not mod two. Uh, mod two, it factors into some number of factors. Uh, these are reducible in R2 and all have the same degree, which is the order of P in the multiplicative group PM star. Uh, and the point is we want to pack as many bits as we can inside each plaintext element, like that. Uh, in, 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 inside each plaintext element in R2. So we want, to, we want the, poly, the cyclotomic to be as smooth as we can get it, mod 2. Uh, so we want the order of 2 to be small. And we can get the order of two to be well, roughly log m. We can get it low, lower than log m, clearly, but uh, we can get it to be roughly log m. So then the number of factors would be phi of m over the order, which we can get as high as m over log m, roughly. 
Uh, and because of Chinese remendering, now this uh, ring of binary polynomial mod phi of m factors uh, um, as, as a direct product of uh, these uh, RPJs, which are modulo each one of the individual factors, uh, which at least when m is odd, gives us one-to-one -one mapping between elements of this native plain text space. The thing that the crypto system actually encrypts are these polynomials, but each one of them, these encode uh, a, a vector of L elements. Each one of them is an element of uh, the finite field uh, G to the D. Um, so this is the, this bullet, this first bullet here is the last bullet from the last slide. Each plain text element in R2 encodes L values in the Galio field 2, two over D. Uh, and if the thing we want to put in this plain text slots are bits and not just gener not generic elements in GF2 to the D, well, GF2 to the D have a subfield which is GF2, so we're just going to use those. Uh, and now I have L bits that I want to plant in a, in a particular uh, plain text element, so I'm just going to do the Chinese remendering uh, to get that um, element of R2 that has these bits uh, in, in the L plain text slot. And once I do that, if I add or multiply two elements in R2, then I get the corresponding additional multiplication of the bits that they encode. Um, and if we have L, which is almost linear in M, which is roughly linear in the security parameter, then we can pack almost linear number of, of bits in a ciphertext. And the size of the ciphertext is also quasi-linear, so all we wasted is just a polylog factor. And, oh, I have this, I forgot about that. Okay, let's do that anyway. Um, now we can do the following operation, which I would, is 10 minutes extra, is, is taking 10 extra minutes, no? Okay. So this would be useful in like two slides from now. Um, now I have two, uh, okay, before I do that, let's, let's stop and remind us where we are. We packed many bits inside each plaintext element. We encrypted this plaintext in a homomorphic encryption scheme that allows us to add and multiply uh, homomorphically in R2, and this in, in terms implies add, adding and multiplying uh, element-wise on these vectors of GIF2 to the D element, which we use to pack individual bits in. Uh, so now we have a one operation on ciphertext that implies additional multiplication on each one of these entries separately. So here is one thing that we can do with this. Uh, suppose we have two vectors, two ciphertext encry encrypting these two vectors, and we want to get a ciphertext encrypting only the red entries and not the, the yellow one. So we want to do a mix and match type of operation. Well, we can generate the plain text vectors uh, corresponding to these two uh, selection bits, we can multiply. Multiplication by constant and multiplication by a ciphertext is essentially the same thing. And you know, one way to think about it is, okay, we're going to we're going to encrypt this and then multiply, but we don't really need to do that. Uh, but okay, so we can multiply. We can generate this plain text. We can uh, do the multiplication. Uh, that would zero out the yellow elements, and then we're going to add them, and we get one uh, ciphertext encrypting all the red entries without any of the yellow ones. And that's useful. Okay. Smar and Verkateran had this idea. They applied it to uh, Gentry's original crypto system, but it applies equally well, even better actually here. Um, if you want to compute the same function on L separate inputs, what do you do? Well, you pack the inputs to the first instance of the function in the first entry in all these vectors, and then the, ins the second instance in the second entry of all these vectors, etc. This is called bit slicing implementation. Uh, and then you just m apply this function only once on the resulting ciphertext. And that would correspond to computing the same function on each slice, each entry in these vectors separately. And at the end, you get one vector 
that you can decrypt and read the answer to the first instance of the, of the function, the answer to the second instance of the function, etc. If you had L uh, inputs that you wanted to evaluate things uh, all at once, that would let you uh, get an L-wise speed up and therefore the overhead, the entire overhead in computing it versus computing it in the clear would only be polylogarithmic because uh, the ratio between computing in the clear and computing in the uh, um, and computing on ciphertext for each single operation is just polylogarithmic. Uh, but we want even more than that. Uh, we want to reduce overhead even when we have a single function that we want to evaluate to a single ciphertext. So the natural way to do that is to pack all the bits in just a few ciphertext and compute while keeping everything packed. Um, and okay, so far I only talked about additional multiplication because these are a complete set of operations. If you can add and multiply, you can compute any function. So you want to compute a function of your choice, write it as a circuit of additional multiplication, and then you can compute it homomorphically. But now you want to uh, use uh, this single instruction multiple data type of operations to evaluate them. And all of a sudden, that's not enough because I'm going to have to add x2 to x3, but they're in different slots of this array. What am I going to do? Uh, this is our input, and we want to map it into different set of arrays that encrypt the same values but in different order. Because if I have x1 and x2 here, then I can just do addition of these two ciphertexts and that would give me an x1 plus x2 and x3 plus x4, which is what I need uh, in my circuit. Um, that means that we have this ciphertext. It encrypts this plain text element. This plain text element encodes this array of values. Is there anything that I can do to this ciphertext that will give me another ciphertext encrypting this, a different plain text element that encodes the same bits in different order. And it turns out that there is. Um, forget about the fact that we want to evaluate it homomorphically. Let's just think of what we want to evaluate. Turns out that we want, what we want to evaluate is automorphism. So I have an element A in this R2 and I want to generate another element A prime which is A applied to x to the power of t. Um, and that turns out to be the, the operations that we need because uh, I'm not going to explain much about it. I think that my slides for the next talk would have that. But, yeah. So if you wanted to work with these uh, figures, do you need any data? Excellent question, and I think it's on the next slide. Thanks. <laughs> um, I'm not going to say why it's true, but when you apply this for particular choices of M, there will be uh, particular choices of T that would cause something that encoded uh, the vector A1 through A, alpha 1 through I, alpha L, uh, to be transformed into a vector that encoded the shift of them by 1. And if you can do shift by 1 and you can do select, then you can do anything you want. Um, so the only thing, so yeah, I mean, it would be really nice if we could uh, uh, apply homomorphically not just additional multiplication, but also automorphism. Um, and yeah, so our decryption procedure is, uh, well, this now, now, I guess, this is a bit of change of notations from before, because now this one is the whole thing, including the error. So before it was that equals uh, is the most significant bit. Now that would be the, the whole thing, including the error. Um, so if we have this, this was the original dec encrypt decryption formula, then we also get the same thing where you evaluate at x to the power t rather than at x. Uh, but since the cyclotomic uh, divides the, the same thing to the power t, then you get the same formula now mod phi m of x. And this is almost what we wanted because um, now when you apply the automorphism to the elements of the vector C, 
what you get is a new um, vector C prime, which is actually an encryption of the, is atomorphed a word? Uh, of the atomorphed uh, plain text, uh, except relative to the wrong key. But uh, we know how to fix that. I mean, we just published a key switching matrix that will get you the right key back and you're fine. All right, summary of uh, what we have from uh, ring LWE based homomorphic encryption. Uh, we have the native plaintext space, which is binary polynomials modulo cyclotomic. Uh, we use each plaintext, native plaintext element to pack L values over some uh, finite field, G of T to the D. Um, the secret key is an element of uh, RQ. The ciphertext is a pair of element in RQ. And decryption is taking the inner product and taking the most significant bit of the result. Uh, we can do a morphic condition. We can do a morphic multiplication. They work element-wise, and we can do a homomorphic automorphism uh, to move these plain text bits from uh, one slot, slot to the other. And then if you have all of that, then you can build higher level protocols that will evaluate any circuit in this packed thing with only polylogarithmic overhead relative to, um, to the uh, time that it takes you to evaluate in the clear. And that's that.